You're listening to a content production of Higher Things. Higher Things is a 501c3 nonprofit organization whose mission is to make the gifts of Christ Jesus known to youth and young adults through gospel rich content like you are about to hear. Consider joining our supporters who make this ministry possible by donating at higherthings.org slash giving, or by clicking the link in the show notes. And now, Higher Things presents Why Bodies Matter with hosts Erica Sorensen and Pastor Harrison Goodman. God takes on flesh and therefore flesh, flesh is then good. Welcome everyone to Why Bodies Matter, a podcast produced by Higher Things for Youth and Their Adults Too. The title of today's episode is Bodies Matter and Birth. I'm your co-host, Erica Sorensen, along with Pastor Harrison Goodman. Hi, Pastor Goodman. Hello. Pastor Goodman, you get to introduce our guest. This is this is my very good friend Michelle Bauman. She is uh, the the director of Why for Life, um, and uh, just a, a fantastic, uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, Christian individual who always sort of makes for sure that the gospel is forward in all that we think, do, and say. It, it's such a refreshing thing uh, when it comes to life ministry to to fall back on the gifts of God. So, Michelle, thank you for being here. Thanks for for inviting me and for the introduction. That's embarrassing. I hope I live up to it. So you set the bar super high. Thanks a lot. Yeah, By the grace of as, God in Jesus, you will. Right. <laughs> as somebody who thrives under low expectations, I understand and I apologize. No, no, no. It's so wonderful to be here. I, it, this is an exciting topic and it's it's always great fun meeting with you guys. So thanks Thank for you. Well, we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about obviously bodies matter and birth, but we're going to start with Jesus because Jesus was a baby. That's right. Um, and so like, but what, Michelle, what is the point of Jesus being a baby? Why does that matter? And how is that going to kind of set the tone for our conversation today? Yeah. So Jesus, Jesus was in the flesh, right? Jesus became incarnate and lived among us. He, he, that, that whole incarnate part is what makes the flesh really important. It's a reminder that, that the body is also a gift from God and holy, made holy by him. So when Jesus comes and uh, takes on flesh, and he still has flesh, he will never, he will never, never separate himself from his flesh. Um, that is a is a a moment in history, a moment uh, in the in the history of of the kingdom, right? When God professes very loudly uh, his love for us, and that fleshly component. Of, of Christ um, not only expresses his love for us, but also uh, solidifies the importance of our bodies as well, right? So Jesus goes through the stages of development that we went through. He was a zygote. He was an embryo. He was a blastocyst, which comes before embryo. Um, <laughs> he, he went through all of those fetal development stages that we term as stages, but that God says, this is how human beings are created and they are created good, right? Very good. They are handmade by God. And so when Jesus takes on that flesh and Jesus starts as, as that, as that, that baby in the womb, we know inherently that what happens in the womb is good too, right? Babies, um, and unborn children are valuable creations um, created by God for for um, for Him for because of out of His love, but also for for good works and as gifts to the world. Um, and so, yes, that that is really really important. Not only because of the whole like He's going to live and die for us, right? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but also because because. Um, God takes on flesh and therefore flesh, flesh is then good, right? 
I, th- I love that connection that you're drawing because I mean, the symbol of our religion is a cross. Um, it, it, it's not just that Jesus was there. It's that Jesus was there with purpose. Uh, the, the cross is, is uh, sentimental to us, not because the thing you hang on your neck forgives your sins, but because it points to where Jesus did. And, and in the same way, um, it, it also, it sanctifies the womb. It, it makes it something that is, is uniquely, not just sentimental, but precious to us uh, because it's not just that Jesus was there, but it's that he was there with with purpose, uh, and, and so when we when we look to to our own unborn, uh, we can not only find value there, humanity there, because Christ was was man there, but but also uh, we we can find God's redemption there, and that lets us talk about the whole thing with a little bit more nuance, because it's really easy to to get your hackles up with this conversation. It's really easy to turn it into a lecture. It's really easy then to paint with very broad strokes, um, but this I think lets us maybe start to to actually pick apart. Uh, everything that, that that gets charged up and wrapped up into this and speak about it with nuance. So maybe just the the the, the question that's sort of under the waters, um, that that God became man, that Jesus was a zygote, that 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 my savior was a fetus. Um, what value is given then to the least of these in this? What value is given to sinners? Right. Well, again, we know that that Jesus sanctifies it, just like you said, right? Jesus sanctifies all of those stages of development. Uh, He died for every child in every stage of development. Uh, He died for every human being in every stage of development. And I think, you know, it's that that doesn't just apply to the issue of abortion, but it also applies to to um, the people who who have lost the parents who have lost uh, a child in the womb. Right. Uh, Those that are um, have experienced miscarriage, um, those that are now suffering from from the, the guilt of abortion, um, it speaks to all of those with hope, right? So for the, the parent who's lost a child in the womb, we know with certainty that God loves that child, that God handmade that child, right? Uh, and, and that that child was valuable and we can mourn and grieve uh, with those individuals, but also uh, for the woman or for the man who has lost a child uh, due to abortion, uh, due to a, a, a fear, right, um, of the future. I mean, ultimately, that's what it comes down to. When we look at women who have had abortions, the vast majority of them felt pressured into making that decision because they felt they lacked something, whether it was financial support or uh, the support of a spouse, right, to help raise this child. And so even even um, that that guilt um, that that we bear or, or that uh, those that make that decision bear is is uh, is taken away in the cross right um, Jesus doesn't just come to redeem the unborn child he does come to redeem the unborn child but he also can comes to redeem the the parent grieving he comes to re, uh, redeem the the parent that is has made a decision that they regret um yeah and i love so much that you're you're talking about this in in terms of of christ's will um because it i think it shapes a, a very different discussion jesus did not become flesh to win an argument but to confront fear and pain suffering and death sin and all of its wages jesus became flesh to confront those things that are underneath all of the arguments. Um, because if all we're going to do is, is say, is this right or wrong? I, I mean, right or wrong, it, it's, it's wrong to, to lose a child. It's wrong to abort a child. Something has gone wrong to, to any parent who was a parent and then is not now. But, but of all the things that made it that way, our Lord took on flesh to address those, that the things that have gone wrong that we can't even find somebody to blame and the things that have gone wrong and all we have are our fingers to point at each other. Um, our Lord took flesh for you for that. And it's only in that flesh that he makes it right. Right. Mm. It is, yeah. it is in the, the, the dying, uh, and the rising again, that he makes it right. Uh, if he didn't take on the flesh, we would have no hope. And so that, that is in essence, you know, where we have to fall as Christians. Um, yeah. The flesh yeah. Is yeah. You, I mean, it's interesting because we started this out with, um, life and God's goodness and the way he has come into the world and became flesh, you know, for us. Um, but then you also talked about all the different issues in this life where, where things are just broken. 
um, and things are are not going right. These bodies aren't perfect. Um, there's fear. There's sin. There's thinking about myself first, and and you know, and how how my life is going to play out. Um, and I think that's kind of you know where the world is coming from. You know, from this this idea of brokenness, and I'm kind of on my own, and I got to figure this out by myself. I know a lot of women when they um, have a pregnancy that's unplanned or unwanted or or so forth, they think they're they're very much alone. So, what is the world doing? How, how has the world sort of gotten this idea wrong, and and what are the consequences of that, or what have been yeah. the consequences of that? Yeah, I think we get it wrong in two different ways. One. Uh, when we answer the questions, the the suffering or the problems or the the things that make us scared, when we answer those questions with death instead of life, uh, the world gets it wrong, right? The world, when the world says that life is disposable, uh, the world gets it wrong. But the other way I think that we um, we often make the same mistake, but on a uh, on the well, we make a different mistake on the same spectrum is when we believe that we are our own gods, that we we have the ability then to to change the flesh God has given us to make it what what we desire it to be. Right. Um, and I, I think there's a spectrum in there. But either way, uh, wherever wherever that falls, uh, it is a denial of the createdness, uh, denial of 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 God himself, right? It is a first commandment issue. Um, yeah. and, and that's where the world fails. The world, the world turns away from God and answers sin and suffering and pain and confusion um, with, I can solve that problem. I can be like God, right? It's right back to Adam and Eve. And that leads to death. And death is, death is, evil and life is good and right. and he makes all things new and he is going to continue to do that. So, I mean, there's hope in that. There's hope in that answer. It's a it's a scary answer. It's one that involves trust and it one one that involves um well well, let let's talk a little bit about I think it's interesting too to talk about we talked about where the world kind of goes wrong in thinking about this. Um I know um you know some some folks who who have experienced um you know pregnancy uh out of wedlock and have tried to attend church sometimes um sometimes the church even gets it wrong so can you talk right. a little bit about how um we uh, as the church can um support life issues in such a way that we understand there's sin involved but but where is the grace and where is the gospel in that what can the church do and per perhaps yeah. hasn't done well and maybe maybe we could do better well first of all as a church, we remember that we are the body of Christ, right? So we come back to that that flesh again. We come back to the the idea that we are to be working as one. And so we are the hands and the feet and the voice of Christ. And so whenever we encounter sin, whenever we encounter brokenness, we are called, uh, as Christ has called us to be his body, we are called then to uphold and sustain that life. Um, whether that life was begotten um, in a manner that was sinful. Life itself, right? A child, a baby is never a sin. A baby is always a gift, right? And yeah. um, no matter, again, no matter how that child was conceived. And so, you know, as the people of God, then we seek to uphold life, right? God didn't come to bring death to the world. Christ didn't come to bring death to the world. He came to bring life to the world. And as his body, we also should be in the business of upholding and bringing life uh, to those who need it most. Um, ultimately, that life is found in, in the word and sacraments, right? But we also recognize that God uses his people to bless his people. Right, that he works through us to uphold life. Um, God doesn't need our good works, but our neighbor does. And um, a lot of that should be happening in the church, right? Where sinners come to be healed, where sinners come to be, to be uh, upheld and, and loved and forgiven and provided for. And that's what, that's what God does for us in the service, right? In his divine service to us, he, he provides for us. He forgives us. 
He upholds our life. He sustains us. And in doing so, he gives us the opportunity then to uphold and sustain the lives of the people around us through our vocations. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so as, as children of God, as the family of God, we can offer food to those who are hungry. We can offer clothing to those without. We can offer financial support and emotional support to the, to the woman who has an unplanned pregnancy. Um, we can uh, share the forgiveness um, to those who have experienced the pain of abortion um, because abortion is not the end, right? Um, the, the final say is God's say. The final, final voice for life is God's voice uh, and God's forgiveness. So like at our church, we have um, a, a memorial to the unborn. Um, and some of those unborn are those who have been, who, uh, whose lives have been ended in abortion, right? Mm -hmm. And our local pregnancy care center um, has a, has every like quarter a group of women that they bring out that has gone through their healing process um, so that they have a place to grieve, right? Hmm. Um, yeah. Again, uh, we, we just, there are so many ways that we can uphold life and reaffirm that, that every life is valuable and that God, God desires to uphold every life. Right. Even even those that we think have committed some sort of unthinkable sin, um, we know abortion is not the unforgivable sin, um, nor is nor is a gender transition, nor is um, uh, rape or incest, nor is um, child abuse. Those are not unforgivable sins, but God doesn't want to leave us there. Right. God yeah, has said I much better. I really, really like the distinction that you made between uphold and sustain and a problem to solve. Um, because that I understand that that a lot of these discussions sort of are, are treated as a problem to solve. Um, and our Lord works to uphold and sustain. But we kind of sometimes have the, the very same temptation that the world does in the church. It's like, I, I want a world without rape. That's not a bad thing. So does Jesus. He hates it so much. He had to die on the cross. He had to, he had to die on the cross just to be able to look at the world without wrath um, because of, of something as, as heinous. But there's still this world full of it. And so instead of looking at this as a problem to solve, we have a God who looks at us and upholds and sustains, which means there's, there's hope not solutions. Um, there, there, there is, there is a, a, an answer that can exist while the problem's still going on. Um, because I, I, this is, this is one of those, those terrifying things, uh, to, to be a, as, as one of the, uh, the ones who have been hurt. Um, now you have a problem and, and we, we want it to go away, but we have a God who promises to, to carry us through it, to uphold us and sustain us. And sometimes he uses our neighbor for it. That's, that's a, that a really, really beautiful distinction that I, I think that, that all, all of us could, could do well to sort of meditate on. I, I love the, the image that you had, we have the hope while the problem is still going on. Right. Um, and, and that hope, it doesn't, it doesn't end, right. It is what carries us through. Um, I often think of per first Peter three fifteen, right. To always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you the reason for the hope that you have. And as Christians, that's what we carry. We carry that hope with us. Uh, even as we face life issues, even as we face trials, um, there is not a single person who is not broken. Um, and, and you mentioned that Erica at the beginning. Yes. Right? Yeah. But what makes it, what, what makes the Christian different is the knowledge that this brokenness is not the end. It is not the answer that God has for us. Um, and despite that brokenness, God is still providing for our lives. Yeah, we have the now as Christians and the not yet, because he is making all things new and he will continue to do so in the new creation. And these bodies that are not so perfect that he has already redeemed, he will make new again in the new creation. So we have that now and not yet as as Christians. And it's a it's a beautiful thing. And it's a message of hope that the world desperately needs. Um you and I have talked a little bit about this, Michelle. We've talked about Gen Z, those fun kids um, <laughs> that we are ministering to right now. They're right. getting older and Gen Alpha is coming up here too, which is, so Gen Z, 
you you guys know if you're Gen Z, you're born 1995 or so to 2012. Um, but it, a really interesting thing is happening with this generation, and and that is that this generation um, has a great respect for life. Do you want to talk a little bit about about that about yeah. what's going on there? And it's not just Gen Z, but but millennials. But yeah, Gen Z has has even taken it a step further, right? So. Um, they do have a great respect for life and they're very passionate about um, about the unborn and about the aged and and about their peers. Right. And they have this they do have a um, a desire for community, a desire for closeness. Um, They recognize that lives are valuable um, and and want those relationships and and we are we are experiencing in our nation a loneliness pan- pandemic or epidemic, right? Um, and it's not it's not lost on our Gen Zers. Uh, they they recognize that that something is missing, that those relationships are missing, and they long for them. And I think um, you know, having felt that loneliness um, that is so inherent in the generation. Um, they they do recognize this this value of others right um and again having lived through the pandemic and having lived through lots of things i think it's been made very clear to them um how important other human beings are uh, you see this this tendency for gen Zers to want to come back and live near family you know that was not like a thing for gen xers that was no like, not at all oh, and you be independent, right? Um, yep. The Gen Zers, they they want that community. They they aren't walking away from it. They're coming back. They're caring for grandparents or for uh, younger siblings. Um, they have this fierce protection for them, which sometimes then often comes out in kind of a a dark side of Gen yeah. Z. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, there's that too in every generation. Um, but this this fierce protection of of individuals and um, and, and their value, their inherent value. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So good job, guys. I wanted to specifically yeah. point that out that you guys are yeah. keep up the good work. Yeah, inspiring. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and then the other, the kind of the flip side of that is, um, I know Gen Z also is. I mean, they're very frustrated. I think by, um by the state of the world and kind of, and how things are going, I think in my own Gen Z children. Um, and it's, there's a little bit of, I don't know if cynicism is the right word, but definitely frustration about sort of what is going on. So, so Michelle, I, we've talked about the gospel a lot, but um, I, I always like to make sure we end on it. How, how can our, how can our children, how can young adults um, and, you know, and the adults around them find hope, even though we are these imperfect people and we live in this imperfect world. Um, where, you know, kind of how is this for them and for all those people in their community they so deeply care about? Right. Well, I think, again, remembering that Christ came to die for individuals, right? He came to die for the whole world, but he also came to die for you and for me. And if it was just one of us alive, he would have come, right? Um, and so his plan was so so motivated and filled and, and perfected by love, then that, that inevitably is going to carry out an overflow into our lives too. There are lots of life issues. And uh, I think Gen Z is very aware of the life issues, right? The homeless, the human trafficking. If anything, our technology has given us a broader view of life issues. Um, but in every single case, we know that that the answer to those life issues are, the answer is Christ, right? The answer is his work in and through his word and his sacraments for us. And we, I think what we can offer Gen Zers is a long-term view. Um, yeah. Gen Zers, again, Perhaps it is technology and an immediate gratification. Perhaps it's probably a variety of things that is fed into this. But but um, having the ability to look back, right, as older generations, the ability to look back and to trace God's goodness in our lives and to share those stories with Gen Zers, 
to share this is how God works in his people. He's got a long-term approach, right? And it may seem like today is not the day that God is active in my life, but but he is. And and we have to to help Gen Zers put on those those long vision goggles. Right? Yeah. Right? Take out the telescopes and look far <laughs> not that God is far away, but that that his his um plan extends uh, for our whole life, right? Not yeah. just for the moment. Um, we have we have hope, and and that hope started long ago, and it will continue until our dying day. Uh, and in each of those moments, he is sustaining us, right? But, yeah. You you talked about um, getting the gifts. Um, where can where can where can Gen Zers go to get those gifts and be fed in community? I, I think the best place <laughs> is church, right? Uh, go to your church, find those gifts there, find the people who who care about you uh, in, in body and soul, find Jesus. Uh, he is present in his word and in his sacraments. He is present uh, to uphold and sustain your life. Um, and and the, the more you are there, the more, you know, we had the, the story of the, the virgins, right? And the oil and, and the oil is the gift of God. It is, it is his word and sacraments. It is what's going to get you through the difficult times. It's what's going to give you the energy to run the long race. Um, and, and God is pouring it out there, uh, filling your cups to overflowing. And it's exactly where he desires to be uh, with you uh, to, to, to give you the gifts that will sustain you through the week, but also through your life. Well, I got nothing else, Pastor Goodman. Michelle, thank you so much for being with yeah. us. Thank yeah, you for joining us today. Yeah, I love discussing the faith in this flesh for this, as you mentioned, disembodied age, but we aren't disembodied. We are we are joined with Christ in our baptism and there is hope. It was lovely to talk to you today. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks for the invitation. It's great talking to you too.